Greetings, sisters and brothers in Christ. This is our Bible study time, and we are going to continue in the book of Ephesians. Last time we finished up, I believe, the book of uh, chapter 5 of Ephesians. This time we'll go into chapter number 6 in the book of Ephesians. Now, in the book of Ephesians, Paul, in chapter 5, brother, Paul moved from talking to the church about things in being in subjection to one another. Matter of fact, let me read verse 21 in Ephesians chapter 5. Verse 21 says, Submitting yourselves one to another in the fear of the Lord. Paul said that saints should acquiesce to each other, should work with each other, should cooperate with each other out of fear to the Lord. Then he went on to talk to the wives. He said wives should be showing reverence to their own husband in verse number 22. And let me read verse number 22. Wives, submit yourself unto your own husband as unto the Lord. And I think we made a statement last week that this word submit does not carry the connotation of somebody being someone else's boss. When a wife submits herself to her husband, that means she not only trusts in what he's doing, but she's also agreeing to what how he's leading her. And of course, we're talking to Christian husbands here, Christian wives. Wives show you joy, reverence to their own husbands in the Lord. I just read verse 22. And then Paul goes on to give a command to husband in verse number 25. Oh, husband, listen to what he says in verse 25. Husband, love your wife, even as Christ also loved the church and gave himself It. Christ demonstrated his love for the church by giving himself, himself for the church. Husbands, love your wives. Oh, what a great command. Now we come to Ephesians chapter number 6. In chapter 6, Paul is going to continue to deal with the with what I consider to be family matters. He's going to continue to deal with things at home. And he is going to address the little one. He starts with the children. To the children, Paul says in verse number one of chapter six, he says, children, obey your parents in the Lord, for this is right. Obey your parents in the Lord, for this is right. This is something that God is pleased with. Honor your father and mother, which is the first commandment with promise, that it may be well with you and you may live long on the earth. You see, no one is left out. I said, no one is left out of this equation. The entire church should be in submission to the church. Wives should be in submission to the husband. Husbands should love their wives. Now he says, children, obey your parents in the Lord. Now, back to fathers in verse number 4, I'm in chapter 6, verse number 4, and he comes back to the fathers. And you fathers, fathers is an important role in the family, has an important role in the family, and you fathers, provoke not your children to wrath, but bring them up in the nurture and admonition of the Lord. 
You know, the book of Proverbs offers some valuable wisdom in dealing with family matters, dealing with fathers and children, mothers and children. In Proverbs chapter 13, verse number 24, it says, He that spareth his rod hateth his son. But he that loveth him, chasten him betimes. So the proverb writer says here, if you love your son and you, your son need to be disciplined, if your son need to be corrected, that could be daughter too, so don't withhold it from them. Give them what they are asking for. Apply the Board of Education, as someone said, to the seat of learning if necessary. I'm not advocating violence here, but parents, we need to take care of our children. Because children don't know the things that you know. They don't know the things that you've been through. They might think they know, but they don't. So go ahead and help them. Give them what they are asking for. Even children, they realize that when parents don't discipline them, they don't love them. A child the other day said, uh, Mom, I'm not going to call the child name, not a parent's name, but say, my parents don't love me because they let me do anything I want to do. And if a child can say that, don't you know that's a statement that needed to be heard by parents? And you fathers, Provoke not your children to wrath, but bring them up in the nurture, watch those two words, in the nurture and admonition of the Lord. Now back to the book of Proverbs. In Proverbs 19, verse 18. Chasten thy son while there is hope, and let not your soul spare for his Christ. Oh, I know when I was a boy coming up, when my mom used to get on my case with that switch, I would scream and yell like she was killing me. But you know, I'd rather have had my dad whip me than my mom, because my mom didn't want to stop. Dad would hit me three times, it was over then, you know, he threw with it. But mom, she whipped me with that Elm switch and then she talked to me a little while. That was more torture than a whooping problem. But anyway, parents ought to take charge of the rearing of their children. In Proverbs 22 verse 15, it says to us, Foolishness is bound in the heart of a child, but the rod of correction shall drive it forth from him or her. Who knows? The child that you bring up properly, the child that you correct when he or she needs correcting, who knows that that will not be the catalyst that lead them one day to the accepting of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. In Proverbs 23, verses 13, through 14, it says, Withhold not correction from the child. For if thy beateth him with the rod, he shall not die all oh, many days. I thought mom was killing me. But you know, I'm still here. So she wasn't killing me. Mom was doing her job. In verse 14, You shall beat him with the rod and shall deliver his soul from hell. All before my mom passed, I told her I thanked, I, I thanked her for what she did with me, to me, and for me while I was coming up as a child. I told, I told her, I didn't understand it, but I thanked her for doing it because she helped me. The rod and reproof give wisdom, but a child left to himself brings his mother to shame. That's Proverbs 29, 15. 
in verse 17 says, Correct thy son, again, or daughter, Correct thy son, and he shall give thee rest. Yea, he shall give delight unto thy soul. In Proverbs 22, verse 6, that'd be the last verse I read in this, con in this context. It says to parents, train up a child in the way he should go. And when he's old, he will not depart from it. So let me say, without being super critical here, let me say to parents or even grandparents or significant others, don't neglect your responsibility to your children or your grandchildren. Whomever you are in charge of supervising today, don't neglect your responsibility. Now, I do not advocate child abuse. Uh, people who abuse children, let me just say this, you are, you are out of order. You are wrong for doing that. Children are not to be abused. Now let me read that verse one more time in verse number four of chapter six. And you fathers, you have an important job. And you fathers, provoke not your children to wrath. You know, a parent should not whip a child or hit a child in any kind of way while he or she is angry because you're teaching them a lesson. Mom only hits me when she's mad at me. A dad only hits me when he's mad at me. A whip me when he's mad at me. He's upset. He's angry. And that teaches them an unhealthy lesson. But the scripture said, bring them up in the nurture and admonition of the Lord. Train up that child. Live a life before that child, where that child can see that you love the Lord Jesus Christ as you say you do. When that child sees that, it's going to rub off on them. Now Paul moved from, he moved out of the home, if you will, out into the marketplace. He addresses those who make up the workforce in society. In chapter 6, verses 5 through 8, he deals with the workers first, or the employees. Chapter 6, verse 9, he deals with overseers, you know, the ones whom we refer to as supervisors, or uh, some even refer to as bosses today. Paul addresses employees as well as the employers. Both have or has a responsibility to each other. The employee has a responsibility to the employer. Employees should not wait around looking at the clock. waiting to just goof off. We're going to break and stay 30 minutes instead of 15. You know, if you're the employee, you need to give an honest day's work. Now, this is just common old plain Bible talk. It's in the scripture. The employer should not mistreat the employees either. You know a whole lot of that go to today. If or should I say, when employees and employers respect each other and do right by each other, all things, even on the job, go so much smoother. In verse 5, you read the chapter 6, verse 5, servants or workers or employees, be obedient to them that are your masters according to the flesh, with fear and trembling in sickness of your heart as unto Christ. 
Listen to what Paul says here to, I'm, I'm going to say, employees. Work as if what you are doing is being done unto Christ. It'll change your attitude about it. It'll change how you look at what you're doing. It matters not what job you have. You may be a street sweeper. You may be a chimney cleaner. Or you may be an executive who has an employer. But do the job as if you are doing it unto Christ and not unto man. Do it out of with fear and trembling in singleness of heart as unto Christ. And notice what Paul says in the next first day. He said, not with eye service, you no know, one eye on your job, but one eye on the clock, and men pleasers, but as the servant of Christ, doing the will of God from the heart. Someone said, a job worth doing, it is worth doing well. With good will, doing service as to the Lord and not unto men. Why? Well, look at verse 8. Knowing that whatsoever good thing any man does, the same shall be Receive, shall he receive of the Lord, whether he be bond or free. And of course, in the day in which Paul lived under the Roman, in the Roman Empire, should I say, there was a lot of servant and master relationships. But if you look at what you're doing, as you're doing it unto the Lord, it should make that much difference. I'm doing it for Jesus. Yes, I'm employed by my employers, but what I do, I do it for Jesus. Now, Paul didn't stop with the employees. Paul went to the employers. In verse number nine, he makes this statement. And you masters, notice the next phrase, do the same thing unto them. Whatever was said unto the employees, also apply unto those who were the employers. Employees need to be treated fairly. Employees need to be given an honest day's pay for an honest day's work. We live in a society now where that there were the capitalists, uh, I guess I could use that word capitalist. Uh, the employers, many of the employers, uh, the employers are trying to get as much out of the employees that they get and still giving them the minimum that they can give them. Let me read this verse in context. And you masters, employers, do the same unto them, forbearing, threatening, knowing that your master also is in heaven. Neither is there respect a person with him. Those who are considered as employers, or as you all say, bosses, or those who are in charge, you need to remember that, talking to Christians now, you have a master as well as the employees have a master. And we all are going to have to give an account of our stewardship, whatever we do, to our heavenly master, unto the Lord Jesus Christ. Now we are going to move into another section of the Christian relationship. We are in a warfare. Paul looks at the saint as sometimes an athlete. Now he looked at the saint as a 
a soldier. Many of you have been in the Army, or the Air Force, or the Navy, or the Coast Guard, one of our branches of service. Some of these things that Paul says to the Ephesian saints, we can latch on to, we can understand it, because we have been in someone's service in this capacity before, we've been around someone who were in a service like this. Finally, when all is said and done, finally, my brethren, all the admonition to the saints is be strong in the Lord and in the power of his might. You know, as we run this Christian race, as we strive and struggle in the warfare that has been thrust upon us, we cannot do it alone. We cannot do it in our own strength. We cannot do it because we have power and might. But we do it in the power and the might of the Lord. Finally, my brethren, be strong in the Lord and in the power of his might. And Paul enjoined the saints, since we are in this warfare, to put on the whole armor of God. God has provided armor for his children. Put on the whole armor of God that you may be able to stand against the wiles of the evil mind, against the wiles of the devil. For we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of the darkness of this world, against spiritual wickedness in high places. Don't consider the brother or the sister that you are sitting in front of or that you are sitting behind or beside to be your enemy. That's not your enemy. Our enemy is an unseen foe. He's a foe that you can't put your fingers up. You can't pin him down, but you know his diabolical work. And he's against every one of God's children. If he had had his way, he would have kept us from becoming a child of God. But the Lord didn't let him have his way. I thank God he had his own way in this matter. I thank God that he saved me of his own free will. When I put my trust in him, when I said yes to him, the Lord accepted me into his family. Being in his family is costly in one sense. Oh, it's a blessing on one hand, but it's costly on the other hand. We are in a spiritual, Now, I want to bring that in before we close. We are in a spiritual warfare. And God has given unto us certain implements that we are to put on. That is, the church ought to have on these implements of warfare. And we're going to pick up those on the next broadcast. Now, I want to ask you, would you please pray? for Sister the Jones family. Sister Melanie lost her father. Pray for the Jones. Pray for the McDonald family. Brother McDonald has gone on to meet his Lord. So pray for that family. Pray for Sister Mobley's 
family. Sister Mobley lost her, I believe it was her last aunt the other day, who was five score plus three years old. Now that's a long time. 103 years old. So pray for Sister Mobley's family. And also, would you pray for the Mary Dawn family? And saints, let's pray one for the other. And let me ask you at this time to be very careful as you travel through out this land in the day in which we are living. Keep your eyes open. Watch out. Look at what's going on around you. And those of you who come up to the church house, I'm talking about Greater Peace Ground, those who come up to the church house, be careful around here because things are happening around here that uh, might not be good for us. Watch the people that drive around on this parking lot. And if necessary, I'm not going to say go out and say anything to them, but they sit down in their cars or in their parking lot, but call the police because this is private property and you have a God-given right to express yourself in having them. You don't say anything to them, just sit in your car, get on your cell phone, ask the police to come, ask them to leave the campus. Also, I was asked for prayer a while ago, I almost forgot one brother, uh, the Sneed family, pray for brother Sneed as well. And why don't we just pray for one another? Father, we bow down in humble submission to your will. Father, we don't understand everything that's going on right now. But what we do understand, what we do know, what we do accept, is that you are still in charge. Everything got to come through you before it can come upon man. Lord, there are some things that you will permit to happen. There are some things that's in your expressive will. Then there are some things that's in your permissive will. Well, Father, we trust you regardless whether it's in your expressive will or whether it's in your permissive will. We know that you're going to take care of your children. And Father, we do pray for these families who named and been called earlier, the Jones family, the Schneed family, the McDonald family, Sister Jeter's family, Sister Mova's aunt. We pray for this family. the body of Christ that meet here at Greater Peace. Although we're not able to come together at this time together, but Father, in spirit, we are still together. And we say thank you for leading your people and directing your people in the path of righteousness. For your name's sake, we thank you in Jesus' name. Amen.